Many people believe that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a conflict over land. But their conflict goes much deeper than the land. You see, the land is, is just a, a side issue. It's, it's a surface issue. When we peel back the layers, we discover that there is a core issue that a lot of people don't think about. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a spiritual conflict. A lot of people don't understand that. You're not going to get that on the news. The news pundits are not going to bring that to your attention. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's going on right now is a spiritual conflict. Uh, of course, uh, Islam is the prominent religion of the Palestinians. Muslims comprise 85% of the population in the West Bank, and they comprise 99% of the population uh, in the Gaza Strip. The central religious text of Islam is the Quran. Did you know that throughout the Quran, Jews are depicted as inveterately evil and bent on destroying the well-being of all Muslims? Did you know that? Quranic doctrine is consumed with expressing hate, much hatred toward Jewish people. Um, the ongoing attempts to destroy the, the Jewish nation of Israel are reinforced in a number of Islamic uh, passages uh, throughout the Quran, which also expresses a command to kill Jewish people. The most hostile passage, uh, which is uh, communicated by Mohammed, referred to in the Hadith, and uh, it is uh, called in Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Number 176, Allah's Apostle said, You Muslims will fight the Jews till some of them hide behind stones. The stones will betray them, saying, O oh, Abdullah, slave of Allah, there is a Jew hiding behind me, so kill him. Now that passage is often cited by jihadists which is involved in, in leading them on their quest to destroy, to kill, to wipe out Jewish people. It is clear in Islam that Jews are to be loathed. They are to be slaughtered. Jews are referred to in Islamic writings as being pigs, as being apes, disbelievers, Individuals who are, in fact, cowards and, and liars. They are referred to as individuals who are a target, who, who try to, to, to run and hide, but they ultimately cannot avoid the sword of the Muslim warrior. That's how they are depicted in Islamic writings. Think about this. The enormous amount of, of hate against Jewish people in the Quran, which points out that, that Jewish people are subhumans, worthy of death. It actually provides a, an existential threat, not only to the nation of Israel, but to Jews worldwide. Muslims all around the world and other peoples are now, with great, great anti-Semitism, screaming at the top of their lungs, gas the Jews from the river to the sea, destroy them, wipe them out. Now, why are Muslim jihadists so determined to annihilate Jewish people? Why are Islamic terrorists bound and determined to destroy the nation of Israel. Why is that? Have you ever wondered that? Well, there are ideological and political 
and even religious answers that people give. But for today, I'd like for us to consider a biblical answer. Because the Word of God addresses all of this anti-Semitism that we see like a tsunami just enveloping the world. Previously, we have seen that anti-Semitism goes beyond prejudice. It goes beyond even evil. It is flat-out satanic. You see, Satan himself is the the initiator of anti-Semitic verbiage and actions. He is the cause, he is the source of all of this hatred, all of this animosity that is breaking out all around the world. Let me propose to you a theory. Think about this for a few moments. What if God's plan of redemption, what if God's plan to make people right with him required the existence and the continuation of a nation? Well, if you could destroy that nation, if you're able to do that, then guess what? You would be thwarting God's plan. Let's take it a little bit further. What if God's plan to redeem people required a specific lineage, a certain family line that would be used by God uh, to form this special nation that God has in mind? Well, if he could wipe out, if you can destroy that specific family line, that, that lineage, then you can thwart God's plan. Well, God does have a plan to redeem a people. He does have a plan of redemption. And God's plan is revealed through the, the existence and the continuation of a particular nation. God chose a specific location, a specific people through whom the plan of God would be revealed throughout the entire world. Now, ultimately, we need to understand that God's plan is that through the Jewish people who happen to be living in the Jewish homeland would be the the setting in which the Jewish Messiah would come into the world. And this Jewish Messiah is not just for the Jews. He is for people in every sector of life, uh, every background imaginable. He is here for people all around the world, regardless of their ethnicity, their race, their, their creed, their color. For God so loved the what? The world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now Satan knows this. Satan knows the revealed plan of God, that what it involves is the existence and continuation of a particular nation, a particular people, and a particular person known as the Messiah. Satan knows all about this. And because Satan hates God, because Satan hates everything about God, he hates the plan of God, Satan does whatever he possibly can to wipe out the Jewish nation of Israel and the Jewish population altogether. Now, to drive home this thought, to see this for ourselves, I'd like for us this morning to do something a little bit unique, and that is to to do a Bible survey by tracing how Satan throughout the Scripture has been actively involved in trying to foil God's plan. You really can trace Satan's activity in how he tried to destroy the plan of God going all the way back to the beginning. And so let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. It's a familiar text, Genesis chapter 3. We know that uh, after Satan was successful in tempting Eve and getting both Adam and Eve to sin in the garden, God levels upon Satan three severe judgments. Judgment number one 
is that Satan will be cursed. He is cursed by God. And this would be a more severe curse than other curses, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. This curse from God would be permanent, it would be irrevocable, it would be eternal, and it would be completely and utterly binding. That's judgment number one, a curse from God upon Satan himself. Judgment number two is that this curse that Satan would be receiving from God would bring about contempt. Satan's curse would involve contempt. Uh, the Hebrew word that we find for enmity uh, is wa'eba, wa'eba. And that can be found in chapter 3, verse 15, where we are told, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so the word enmity is used there. And again, it's the word uh, wa'eba. It can be translated hostility or hatred. The word gives uh, the sense of, of being in a state of, 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 of ill will, strong ill will, of having this hateful animosity, uh, this spiteful anger that is going to be existing. And ever since Adam and Eve fell in the garden, Satan has been miffed. Uh, he has been furious because he knows that his curse is not going to be lifted at any point in time. This is a permanent, eternal, irrevocable, binding curse. And he hates how God says this curse is going to come about. It's going to take place through the seed of the woman. And so Satan has hated the, the seed of the woman. He's been trying to get after the seed of the woman ever since the time of Adam and Eve falling in the garden. The seed of the serpent refers to demons and all those who serve in the kingdom of darkness. And so demons and unbelievers, in some cases unbeknownst to them, that is unbelievers, have been carrying out Satan's agenda to destroy the seed of the woman. Well, there's a, a third judgment that we find in this uh, verse, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Not only is Satan cursed, not only does his curse involve contempt, but a part of the judgment, the third judgment, is that he will be crushed. Satan will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but Satan's head will be crushed. He will receive a fatal death blow when he is the ultimate loser. Now obviously Satan hates the fact that his, his agenda and his influence upon others is, is going to be messed up with. It's going to be thwarted, that, that God is going to, to, to smash it at a certain point. He hates the fact that his kingdom is going to come to an end and his rule on the world. And so throughout history, Satan has been involved in trying to undo, to make impossible the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He has been actively involved in trying to destroy the seed of the woman. Now in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, we come across the first murder. This takes place from the first human being who was born. Not immediately directly created by God, but born, Cain. We know that Cain slew his brother, Abel. And what was the impetus behind that? Well, you might be surprised to know that according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, we're told that Cain was of the evil one. Other renderings word it this way. Cain is ruled by the devil. Another translation says his heart is possessed by the devil. Yet another Bible translator says he belonged to Satan. Here's another one. Cain was a son of the devil. Philip's translation. 
And yet, uh, finally, one puts it like this very succinctly, that Cain is Satan's man. A commentator by the name of Marshall writes, Cain drew his inspiration from the evil one, the devil, who is himself the archetypal murderer. And so we know what took place. We know that Satan comes, uh, comes along, he influences Cain, and Cain slaughters his brother. He carries out the first manslaughter. And it could be that Satan is thinking, oh, this is fantastic. Genesis 3.15, which wasn't written yet, but no doubt he was aware of, of all the curses, all the judgments against him. He must have thought that, oh, this is great. The seed of the woman is destroyed, and I'm good to go from this point on. Well, instead of that being the case, the contingency plan that kicked in, plan B, if you will, uh, was that uh, Satan's plan was foiled. He could not uh, cause God's plan to fail in connection to the seed of the woman. And that's because Cain, after he killed Abel, God saw to it that Seth replaced Abel. And so because of Seth, the promise of the seed of the woman would be able to continue on. And so Satan's plan was foiled. From Genesis chapter 3, would you take a moment to look at Genesis chapter 6? In this context, uh, we discover how almost uh, everyone in the ancient world during the antediluvian period of time before the flood uh, were strongly influenced no doubt by Satan, because of the greatness of the wickedness that was being carried out at that particular time. Genesis chapter 6. You say, well, um, I don't read anything about Satan in Genesis chapter 6. Why are you bringing him up? We need to remember that according to 1 John 5, 19, it says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. And so with that in mind, keep uh, that thought there while we look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. There we, we learn about Satan's behind-the-scenes influence as he expands his influence to the masses with this worldwide global uh, influence. Genesis 6, verse 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Drop down to verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with Hamas. That's the Hebrew word right there. Hamas, did you know it's found in the scripture? It's right there, verse 11. The earth was filled with Hamas or violence. The world was so depraved, it was so morally debauched that people exclusively had only evil, wicked intentions and, and thoughts. That's all that they ever thought were, were sinful ideas that came to them. And Satan's plan was to see to it that the whole world would become so wicked that God would have no recourse, that God would have no choice but to destroy the entire world. Well, God did destroy the world. But rather than that destruction taking place through a scorched earth policy, God destroyed the world through a soaked earth policy. He flooded out the world, and it wasn't that the entire world and everyone in it was destroyed. There was one family, a family consisting of eight individuals who God preserved. And so the seed of the woman would be able to perpetuate through that, that one family, Noah's family. Once again, Satan failed to stop God's plan to prevent the by trying to prevent the seed of the woman uh, from giving birth to this one referred to in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Fast forward, if you will, to a, a completely different time. 
uh, from Genesis chapter 6, would you go to chapter 16? And in Genesis chapter 16, particularly in, um, well, chapter 16 through 18 and 21 are the, the passages. And we're not going to land on any one particular verse, but in those chapters, what we discover is that uh, she was called Sarai before she was Sarah, and Sarai uh, was unable to give birth. Childbearing was, was not something that she was able to carry out. And sh so she comes up with this idea. I can't give birth to a baby. I'm sure Abraham would like to be a daddy. So, hmm, what shall we do about this? I know. Let's get Hagar, my maid, uh, to become impregnated through my husband Abraham and see if that works. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Abraham sleeps with Hagar, the maid. Hagar gets pregnant. And as a result, she gives birth to Ishmael. The descendants of Ishmael are the Arab people. Now, even though Sarai, who became Sarah, was really old at a certain point, she is told that, that she's going to become uh, a mommy one day. And so sure enough, Abraham and uh, Sarah come together. She actually gets pregnant. She's in her 90s. As mind-blowing as that may seem, but she really does get pregnant and she gives birth to a boy, and they name him Isaac. Isaac is the son of the covenant. The descendants of, of Isaac are the Jewish people. Animosity and bloodshed has been carried out in huge waves on account of the extreme hatred, animosity, the tension between the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael. And they have been going back and forth. They have been at it ever since. And that's what we're seeing playing out in the Middle East. It has been playing out for, for centuries, for several millennia. Well, let's uh, continue. But before we do that, keep in mind that that Satan loves it when there's all this, this hate, all this animosity that's going on between uh, the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of, of Ishmael. He loves that. He loves that tension. And he hopes to annihilate the Jewish people. So what have we seen so far? We've seen some ways in which Satan has been actively involved in trying to destroy the seed of the woman uh, we have seen how that uh, took place uh, through Cain, how that uh, took place on a global level during the ancient civilization, during antediluvian times before the flood. Uh, we said during uh, the time of uh, Abraham's sons, but there's more, a lot more. We see how Satan, no doubt, has also been involved in the animosity with Isaac's sons. Yeah, there have been some serious issues with uh, Abraham's sons, but also Isaac's sons. And the sons of, of Isaac were two individuals. Do you remember who they were? They were twins, Esau and Jacob. Jacob is known as the, the heel grabber. He came in second place. Esau beat him to being born. Well, there was a time when Isaac recognized that he is getting really close to death. And he thought to himself, you know what, I, I really want to, to give a special blessing to my firstborn. Um, I want to see to it that, that Esau gets this blessing. Well, I, uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, becomes privy to these intentions that, that Isaac has. And, and she discloses to Jacob, her favorite, hey, guess what dad's going to do? He's going to give a special blessing to your bro. 
And um, I, I'd rather that you get the blessing. And so what happens is, is, is Jacob, he's, um, he's going to cooperate with mom. And he is successful in, in tricking his dad, who had a really hard time seeing. He tricks his dad into thinking that he is his brother Esau when it was really Jacob. And the text uh, tells us in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, it says, Esau, way Yistam, felt antipathy or aversion towards or, or bore a grudge toward or hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Jacob said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now think about this. If, if Esau was successful, if he was able to accomplish what he wanted to do, to kill his, his brother, then the unique blessing that God had intended all along from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob would have been thwarted. And so Rebecca, mom, once again, God works through her to save the day. And she says to Jacob, you got to get out of here. Your brother is going to boost you into eternity. Leave. Get out of here. And that's exactly what Jacob does. And his life is preserved. And so as a result of that, once again, the messianic seed of the woman from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, the plan of God does not get thwarted. It takes place exactly as God had intended. Uh, let's uh, consider yet another example that the Word of God brings to our attention. This will become very familiar to you, and it has to do um, with Pharaoh. And we discover this in the very next book, the book of Exodus. And so when you come to the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Law of Moses, the f first five books of, of Moses, uh, we discover a time when, when Pharaoh is fearful. And the reason why he is so paranoid, so anxious, is the fact that, that uh, the Jewish population was growing. They're, they're increasing, they're multiplying, and Pharaoh is concerned that all these Jewish people are going to overtake his kingdom. He doesn't want that. He wants to preserve what he has. And so what he does is he gives a demonic edict to have all of the Jewish baby boys killed off by the midwives. And the midwives don't cooperate. They come up with a story. They say, uh, you know, these, these Jewish mommies, uh, they're vigorous, and, and, and they gave birth before we could change uh, their destiny and what would happen with the, the baby boys. So, you know, we, we're, we're sorry, but this is what happened. Uh, you know, the, the boys were, were still born. But why was, was Pharaoh so completely and utterly committed to the genocide of the Jews? Very simply, the answer is that he was satanically driven. He was satanically motivated. He was an agent of Satan. And if Pharaoh had succeeded, if he wiped out all the, the Jewish baby boys, including Moses, then the Jewish people would not have been released from Egyptian bondage. And the Messiah would not have eventually been born in Israel because they still would have been enslaved in Egypt. And so Moses had to have been born. God had to work through Moses the deliverer so that the chosen people of God would be able to experience an exodus out of Egypt and eventually go into the promised land where the Messiah would eventually be born. Well, the next example we come to of satanic um, um, desire to wipe out the sea of the woman takes place uh, with Israel's first king. Who was that? Anybody? Sure about that? 
A few of you have uh, read your Bible recently. Who was the, Israel's first king? Come on. Saul. Yes, Saul. Problem was, Saul has this rival by the name of David. David took out the giant. He takes out Goliath with his slingshot, cuts off his head, and he, he develops quite a name for himself, David. And the women at a certain time are, are parting as they think about David. They're celebrating David. And they're coming out with this song. Uh, Saul killed his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. And so Saul got jealous. He wanted to be the main man. He wanted to be the, the head guy on the, on the totem pole. He didn't want all this tension going to David. What we discover is that Saul is pursuing David. He wants to kill him. He's, he's like throwing spears at him. He's, he's trying to just have him die and get off the planet. And if Saul became successful, guess what? That would have messed up God's plan. Because we know from 2 Samuel chapter 7 that there is what is known as the Davidic covenant, which would be an everlasting covenant which God would have take place in which the Messiah uh, and offspring of David would come into the world. So if Saul was successful, the Davidic covenant could not have taken place. This eternal kingdom promised in 2 Samuel 7 could not have unfolded. But once again, Satan's plan fails. And God's plan stands. The seed of the woman is still going to carry out God's purposes. Because the Messiah would come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then we're going to see how this also takes place through others. So let's look at what happens next. And this might be um, a little unfamiliar to you. Uh, for this, um, you don't need to turn there, but in 2 Kings chapter 11, we are introduced to a woman named Athaliah. And Athaliah, uh, like so many politicians that we have in our, our day and age, thought that the, the sun must have uh, risen and fallen on her, that, it, that everything in life was about her. And so what she does, does is just incredible. She, she, she decides, I'm going to wipe out the whole royal line of Judah, Judah being one of um, the sons of Jacob, one of the 12 tribes of Jacob. And so that's what she tries to do. She, she wants to kill off her own family, her, her children, who could be a part of this, this messianic lineage. But what happens is one of her grandsons gets hidden by a midwife, Joash. Joash is spared. He's in the messianic line. And so if Athaliah had been successful, Satan would have won. Game over. The seed of the woman could not uh, come onto the scene in which the Messiah would come here. But, once again, Satan's plan fails. And the seed of the woman is still able to come on to the scene. We're going to look at uh, yet another example. This guy was as anti-Semitic as they get. He was a big-time Jew hater. His name was Haman. We discover Haman in the book of Esther. Um, Haman hated the Jews. The Jews were enemies to Haman. You can read about him in uh, Esther chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Those verses point out that this anti-Semitic megalomaniac had real issues. It says, when Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Mordecai being a Jewish man. Haman was filled with rage, but he considered it beneath his dignity to kill Mordecai alone. Why stop there? For they had told him who the people of Mordecai were, so Haman sought to annihilate all 
the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were found throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus. And so just like Hitler, just like Hamas, Hayden, uh, Haman's goal was the genocide of all the Jewish uh, people. But once again, Satan's plan fails. He's not able to accomplish his goal. What takes place is that uh, Haman's hostility toward the Jews resulted in his own death. He got killed on the gallows that were prepared for Mordecai. And beyond that, instead of all the Jewish people being wiped off the face of the earth, the Jews are able to protect themselves, they're able to defend themselves, and so they kill those who are going to come after them, according to uh, Esther chapter 9. It's, it's known as the, the, the Feast of Purim, which celebrates how God protected the entire Jewish people from being slaughtered. Haman's life, by the way, is an example of the fate that faces those who oppose God and his plans. Anti-Semitism has existed going all the way back to the beginning, the earliest sections of Genesis. And, and people have paid for it dearly when you go against God, when you go against God's chosen people. Setting oneself against God and persecuting his people is futile. Haman tried it, didn't work. Hitler tried it, didn't work. The Antichrist will try it. It's not going to work for him either. So far, we've, we've looked uh, at the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, let's look at just a few examples in the New Testament. So let's uh, swing over to Matthew chapter 4. And, and here we find the familiar passage of Satan tempting Yeshua, Jesus. Satan must be scratching his, his head thinking, you know, I, I've tried all these different ways to kill off the seed of the woman, and it's just not happening. I, th I think I have to get directly involved here. And, and so what does Satan, what does he do? He, he has Jesus in the wilderness, and he unleashes uh, three very strong temptations upon the Lord. And sometimes we fail to think of the second temptation. We think about the trilogy of temptations just kind of generally, but uh, with the second temptation, Satan comes along and he says, you know, Jesus, just... You know, you're on this pinnacle. You're on the, the top of this, this temple. Go ahead and, and just toss yourself off. Throw yourself off of, off of this pinnacle. And you'll be fine. You'll be okay. In fact, you'll, you'll have angels according to your own word. The angels will come along and, and they will protect you. They will guard you so that not even your, your feet get, get bruised. Do it. Just take the leap. And you've got angelic power, man. Get after it. So what does Jesus do? He could have called on the angels. But what does he do? He quotes scripture. He gets up in the face of the enemy and he quotes the word of God to him. That's exactly what he does. And even though Satan's suggestion is bizarre, throw yourself off. After all, the angels are going to protect you. You're not going to even dash your feet on, on, on the rocks or anything. Um, that's not what happened. Jesus says no. God's word says this, don't tempt the Lord your God. And once again, Satan's plan fails. He can't stop God's plan. He can't do it. Well, even before that, we need to back up the trolley here for a few moments and consider uh, during the time of Jesus' birth how another guy by the name of Herod, who also, whose name starts with the letter H, I tell you, these people with H, Amos, Herod, 
uh, Heyman. Uh, if, if you have a first name that starts with H, uh, I'm sure there, there's no connection there whatsoever. But it's just interesting to note in the scriptures how several of these people, their first name starts with H. Anyway, Herod. Herod finds out that there's a king that's going to come on the scene. This is a king that is born king of the Jews. He's going to be born in the town of Bethlehem. He gets the word, the, the wise men bring this uh, to his attention and and in a bogus attempt of trying to convince the wise men that he was going to, to also worship this, this uh, new king. Um, an angel comes along and, and redirects the holy family, uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, get out. And so they go to Egypt, and they stay there until Herod dies. Um, so before they leave, Herod is so miffed that what he decides to do is he's going to slay all of the, the Jewish baby boys, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, who are two years of age and younger. And I already told you how Satan's plan is foiled. It's on account of the fact that the Holy Family leave the area and Jesus' life is spared. So there are numerous ways in which Satan has sought with his anti-Semitic devices to kill off the seed of the woman. And finally, there have been numerous times in the New Testament where you discover various individuals, religious leaders and others, who tried to kill Jesus. They wanted to, to throw him off a cliff. They tried to kill him in any way that they could and he's able to escape. It's a great thing, but they can't succeed. Jesus slips out from underneath them. Finally, as we wrap this up, I'd like to draw to your attention that on one Friday in spring, Jesus is beaten, he is crucified for hours on end, experiencing incredible torture and around three o'clock in the afternoon he draws his last breath his blood stained body is limp the corpse of Christ is wrapped up in linen placed in the tomb but have you ever thought that on that particular Good Friday there very well could have been a party going on in hell Satan probably thought, yes, we finished off the seed of the woman. He's gone. He's dead. I win. The seed of the woman loses. And what a mind-blowing event it must have been. It so happens that he learns about the, the fine print. You see, Jesus says, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Once again, Satan fails. He cannot accomplish his objective to defeat the seed of the woman. You say, Jeff, okay, thank you. Um, I get it. I, I see that throughout the scriptures. Satan was very active. He was very much at work in trying uh, to destroy the seed of the woman, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. What does that have to do with today? What does it have to do with all the anti-Semitism that we see taking place today? Well, it has everything to do with it, this global anti-Semitism. Satan continues to pour out his fury, his anger, his rage on God's people, which includes the church, it includes the nation of Israel. Because the redemptive plan of God required the existence and the continuation of a nation, because the redemptive plan of God required a particular person, the Messiah, who comes from a particular people group, the Jews, in a particular land, Israel, Satan does everything he possibly can to thwart the plan of God. 
he is still involved in pulling out the stops to destroy the Jewish people. Our world is getting darker and darker and darker, and the reason for it is because Satan's time is short. He knows his time is short. So he's pulling out the stops. And our world is flipped upside down where evil is considered good and good to evil. And we see his fury being unleashed upon the entire Jewish peoples throughout the world. Harvard, MIT, Penn, the, the presence of these high-ranking universities could not even come out during a congressional hearing and denounce anti-Semitism when it's being spewed out on their college campuses. They couldn't bring themselves to it. They hemmed and they hawed. I tell you, even our own country is moving in the direction where we are turning our back against God's chosen people. May God have mercy on us. In the meantime, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the divine protection of the Israeli defense forces. Pray that, that God would be at work in protecting the Jewish people. Pray for Palestinians. They need to know the Lord too. They also need the Messiah. Pray for Hamas. Pray that, that they will experience a radical conversion, that they will come to know the Lord. We don't hate Hamas. We don't hate Palestinians. We're not just in the Jew camp. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Satan's plan was an unmitigated failure. It continues to be an unmitigated failure, even though it appears that he's winning, and it will be, in conclusion, an unmitigated failure. Satan is going down. He cannot ultimately be victorious over God. And if God is for us, who could be against us? No one. You're on the right side, my friend. Stick with Jesus. Stick with the Messiah. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.